Hi, everyone. If you want to grab a seat, I, they, you know, it's always a little early Friday mornings, but uh, as someone said, the advantage of a big conference is that there's a lot of speakers, so the auditorium feels, feels full uh, immediately, but students will trickle in throughout the day, and everyone is very excited. Uh, I'm Amal Andraus. I'm the dean uh, of the school, and I just uh, wanted to say a few words of welcome um, and, uh, and an introduction to Juan Herreros, who masterminded this with uh, Enrique Walker. And uh, we started to talk about this symposium uh, early on last year, um, and you know, wondering how I think Juan and, and Enrique, especially Juan throughout his seminars, have been looking at the question of practice and, uh, and how it's become, in a way, a project in itself, um, but not in just this kind of say yes to everything, but rather um, how to find ways to, to engage, to push the discipline, to expand uh, how we practice and to really kind of be continue to be creative and find agency. And uh, in the conversation, uh, we were kind of, uh, I, you know, I was also commenting on the fact that it had been 10 years since Ordos, Ordos 100, which in fact was a kind of moment of launching at least my generation uh, of, of architects and how there was a sense that this, this the, you know, this generation after was actually already operating in a completely different way. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, uh, it was worthwhile digging into the, these modes of operation and to look at uh, these modes uh, you know, across uh, different cities around the world and to kind of have this sort of cross section uh, so that it wasn't so uh, narrowly kind of focused on the US or Europe or, you know, to kind of understand that some of the preoccupations that, um, that we, we have here are, are quite different. Um, and in particular, we thought it was a really good way to encourage our own students to think about, you know, how they want to launch into the world and, and, you know, learn about how to, you know, what are the means that we have to develop for them here. Um, and so, uh, uh, on this note, I will give the floor to Juan, who I'm really, uh, I, you should also know that uh, those of you who are here are 20 amongst 100 that were um, kind of shortlisted, and uh, one of the project that we're uh, thinking of is the life after this moment here together, where I think there'll be a series of podcasts and conversations, you know, and ways to kind of create this, this kind of landscape of practices around the world. So please welcome Juan Herreros. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Amal, for the introduction and support of the Constructing Practice Symposium from the very, very first steps. And very especially for bringing to the school this question about the practice, because um, it's really necessary to insist in the need of talk about the practice as a pedagogical issue, as part of the education, as part of the training of the architects, because it's here in the schools of architecture where we can give a contemporary value and a significant redefinition to the, to the topic. Thank you also to Enrique Walker uh, for your complicity. And all you know Enrique with his fine timing formulating the to the point question all the time. No? Um, we together create the Transfer Dialogues uh, series and very especially the two on two sessions. These two on two sessions uh, consist in the invitation to two offices to do a kind of presentations like we have asked you to do today uh, and to open a conversation about the confronting contexts where I operate and discovering that the differences, are, the differences are not always where it were supposed. Those conversations have been the laboratory of this event today. For us, the question of the symposium, as Amal has uh, pointed, is that 
is founded in the idea that the establishing of their own office is a project in itself. It's an act of design. And in consequence, it's an intellectual exercise that uh, blurs the borders between theory and practice. Today, uh, we want to talk about this project with a bunch of young offices all around the globe established in the past 10 years. Uh, this is the first selection we did. This is, here you have 160 offices, more or less. And this is the map that shows something very uh, incredible if we think uh, what has happened in the last uh, 10 years. No? All these offices are founded after 2006. And it's, uh, it's a discovery to, 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 to know that you can find this kind of offices in every country around the world. The merit to, to be in this map, to be part of these 160 offices, is to develop any kind of critical practice of architecture that contributes, contributes to redescribe the context where they operate. So that was our first um, reason to select uh, the names. The practice is sorted today after transforming these 260 into the famous 100 that uh, are this response to after 10 years after orders are here because they show a deep commitment with, in the selection of the topics, the influences, and the self-imposed constraints to work with. So we are looking, we have been looking for practices that reveals a uh, desire or show that the way of working and the method, the method of producing architecture is really something that is done as they want to, to do it, no? and not as a consequence of circumstances that you don't uh, think a lot about them. No? And they compose uh, a selection of the present and, and I think an incredibly interesting photo of the next future of our discipline. Watching to the materials of the different offices we are going to have today, we could see that in the last year, we have discovered this collection of significant changes in the motivations and the concerns that have oriented the establishing of the new practices. This generation is deeply aware about the need of a new instruments to dialogue with the present, from geopolitical issues to environmental sensitivity, from material culture to the redefinition of the everyday as architectural material, from the impact of new technologies to the social equations that include all the political and global phenomena, from immigration to natural disasters. We have asked them to present for 15 minutes. Sorry for this <laughs> pressure about <laughs> compressing all your ideological universe in 15 minutes. But we want to know about your strategies and approaches to the discipline from the different regional contexts. And the questions are, how do you do what you do? And how do you respond to the concern about what kind of architect I want to be? So if the traditional models are not the ones to follow, we have to invent. We have to design the new models. And because we are in a school of architecture, and because an ambitious expression of global thinking strategies is behind many of the practices invited today, we want also to know about the, we want to have a specific focus on the training of, of these uh, colleagues and understand how the education they receive it has informed the decisions in the establishing of these uh, practices. The session will be organized in five panels related to five kinds of practices. The classification of these five groups could be many others, but thanks to these uh, maps, we have, understand, we have understood that there are some particularities that could be interesting to think about them. The first is from global education to local practice, people who left their homes or cities to be educated abroad and came back or changed the place where the practice is, is done from. The second is the idea of from local to transnational, how 
in the last decades, we have discovered an incredibly intense and active group of small offices all around the world working globally uh, that are quite far from the model of the exports of architectures uh, that we could see in the decades before with the big architectural offices exporting architecture to the emerging economies. The third group is related to the redefinition of the idea of collaboration. So how the collaborative uh, uh, trans transdisciplinary work uh, is today a new edition of uh, the former uh, groups of specialities, basically an architect helped by engineers in tech with technically specialized in very different fields, but all of them around the, the production of the project and how today we really uh, deal and, and dialogue with many other disciplines and not necessarily uh, close to the uh, field of architecture. The fourth is about the material culture as uh, instrument to, to design. This is also um, reivindication of the uh, construct constructability of, of architecture, the desire of be built, so, uh, and how materiality is a new global way of thinking through the engagement with uh, local technologies. And the last, uh, fifth, is norm core, and is, a, I think, an interesting conclusion about how we can give new values to neutrality as a critical attitude, and how perhaps the, the <coughs> preserve the discipline in, in, in terms of the practice from a neutral attitude can be really a very, very um, intellectual and, and deep position. Before inviting Enrique uh, Walker to, the, to come to the front to introduce the first panel, I want to thank to all the staff of the fourth floor who are over there, uh, who have worked like crazy to make possible this intense journey. We hope all of you got this pamphlet, which is a good present for early birds, uh, because we, we don't have so many. Uh, but it's, it's easy to open, and you will be able to add in more pages, and the pages uh, are, are, will be in the, in the web uh, site of the, of the school, with the bios of other offices who are not here today, and that will be increasing the, the, the files of these uh, emerging practices uh, research that uh, today is uh, starting or, or, or really is, is being public, but at, at the same time is, 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 is only the first of the, of the congresses that we hope to do in the next future, today, together with this podcast that has been also announced by Dean uh, Amalandraus. And uh, thanks to the PhD candidate uh, Esteban Salcedo, who has driven all the research and the production of these diagrams uh, that made visible many unexpected ingredients and the emer of the emerging offices and helped us to detect, as I told you before, the different kind of practices we were looking for. If you are here, you have crossed the corridor or the small, we, what do we call the tunnel, uh, where some of these uh, diagrams and images of the work of the offices invited uh, are there. So it's part of the materials that uh, you will be able of finding in the, in the web of the, of the school. So I think that's it. We have a whole day uh, to, to talk about architecture and establishing of the, of the practice. Um, thank you and, and enjoy the presentations and let me invite Enrique Walker to the front to present and to introduce the first panel. Thank you very much. Good morning. Welcome to Columbia GSAP. My name is Enrique Walker. I direct the Advanced Architectural Design Program at the school. It is a pleasure for me to introduce the first panel of our Symposium Constructing Practice. Uh, the panel is entitled Global Local from Education to Practice and brings together three practices who decided to operate in and from their home city or country um, following a uh, an architectural training experience uh, abroad. We are delighted to have uh, as guest speakers Max Nunez, whose practice is based in Santiago, Chile, via New York, GSAP indeed, welcome back. Jiang Xiang He and Ying Jiang from O Office, based in Guangzhou, China, via Leuven and Versailles. 
And Sal Salvador Macias and Maggie Peredo from Macias Peredo, based in Gu Guadalajara, Mexico, via uh, Barcelona. Jay Carpenter from GSAP will act as uh, moderator. Please join me in welcome our first speaker, uh, Max Nunez. Hello to everyone. Thank you guys for the invitation to be back in Colombia. I believe that I believe architecture is something you never stop learning, acquired throughout time in a very long term by constantly looking, discussing, and designing buildings. For me, this education started at a very young age, as I am son of an architect. Uh, but going to architecture school is certainly a key moment of this learning process. I studied architecture at Universidad Católica de Chile in Santiago at the end of the 90s, beginnings of the 2000s. The school at the time was still very isolated from the rest of the world, uh, but the scene was beginning to open and new ideas were emerging. There were at least two important references which represented opposite ways of understanding the idea of context. The early work of Matthias Klotz, to the left of the image, with his pure static boxes suggested an abstract and distant relation with any notion of place. He emphasized a strong figure background contrast through, through simple structures, proposing a totally silent architecture. On the other side, to the, to the right, the early works of Smiljan Radic by means of an as found sensibility, offered a connection with the landscape and its building traditions. Through rough materials and basic means of construction, he established a very symbolic, layered, and rhetoric approach to context, in, to in total opposition, in a way, with Klotz's uh, strategy. During my last year at architecture school in Santiago, my classmate, Bernardo Valdez and I received the commission to do this house. At the time we had little notion of what we were doing, but many of the decisions laid down on this small house are ideas that still matter to me today. Uh, for example, how a specific topography can alter the established notions of a given program. Also, the neutralization of the free plan by means of the domestic life and the problematic relation between two or more structural systems working at the same time. In any case, with this house, we were trying hard to do something different from the total abstraction of clots or the sensible materiality of Radic. The success of that house, um, of that first commission, translated into more work. Uh, I established a partnership with my friend Nicolas del Rio for almost six years, and we worked uh, non-stop designing a bunch of private houses. Some of those projects are shown in this image. Most of these projects were located in distant regions of the country in very diverse geographies and climates. Uh, this characteristic diversity of the Chilean landscape translated somehow in, into our work. In consequence, we were always trying to do something different, experimenting with new materials, structures, and developing various building types. This was the work of DRN Architectus, DRN Architects. But in 2008, this happened to all of us, I guess. We all remember those, those days. And in Chile, like everywhere else, we were like this guy in the photo, going home with not much to do. Uh, but instead of staying in, in Santiago, we decided, me and my partner at the time, we decided to leave um, and study abroad. Uh, we applied for grants of the Chilean government and we closed the office and later split the partnership. I wanted to see, in a way, um, how the real crisis looked like, so I came to, to New York City, to Columbia, um, to the Master in Advanced Architectural Design between 2009 and 2010. In retrospective, I, I feel that the atmosphere in Colombia those years was also in a turning point. 
The economic crash had eclipsed the ideal of the star architect and the digital parametric moment was no longer in the center of the discussion here. There was a strange atmosphere, but in a good way, extremely challenging, in which no one knew which direction to take. This was great because there were no leading trends at the time. Let's say that this was just before the axonometrics of San Rocco and everything that associated with it. Uh, for me, Colombia had a profound effect, uh, especially the very critical approach to design of some of its key professors and studios, which offered a kind of psychoanalytical experience uh, for someone who had been practicing for a while. Uh, in particular, Enrique Walker's uh, studio, which proposed the dismantling of architectural cliches, made us really conscious of our design potentials, sticks, and, and limitations. Looking back, this academic experience offered me awareness in very architectural terms of how I wanted to move forward. Max Núñez Arquitectos was established in 2010, right after completing my master. Uh, to be frank, my practice can only be described through the buildings we have done and the ideas revolving around them. These ideas have appeared in the process of designing and many times even in retrospective after finishing construction. And these are quite old ideas, I guess. Um, I suppose we're definitely not avant-garde for a place like Colombia. We're much more like rear-guard. <laughs> uh, uh, rather than declaring a conscious plan in relation to my practice, as requested by Juan in his kind invitation to this symposium, I prefer to declare that I work with a constellation of Thoughts, uh, a very pretentious name that now that I see it uh, so big. <laughs> um, but, but these different terms uh, help to link, in a way, the, the, what we've done uh, in the office. Um, these are six, or actually seven. Here you can see six, but there are seven, which is a better number. Uh, these are seven priorities, um, uh, which are not thought in strict acad academic terms. I believe it's more about free interpretation, association, and where possible misreading of these ideas is totally allowed. In each project, these themes can be found working together or separately. They can overlap, or maybe you won't find them at all. Uh, don't worry. They do not offer in any way a final answer to my work, and don't seek to give a formal totality or seamlessness. Each project has its own complexities, and in accepting those complexities lays the true potential from which to discover, hopefully, something new. Um, the first idea, I'm going to go really fast through these uh, concepts. Topo topographical patterns, uh, this strategy in relation to context aims to dismantle the very Chilean cliche of the autistic object set in the landscape, and also avoids any kind of subjective rhetoric. The idea is that a closer negotiation between the building and the pre-existing topography can redefine some preconceived internal organizations of domestic life and establish a more dynamic relation with the ground. A very simple and beautiful example of this hypothesis is how Asplund in his Gunnard house brings an exterior condition of the landscape, its sloping topography, right in the middle of the, cent the center of the domestic life um, here he collapses the stair and the chimney while slightly rotating the direction of the, of the floor plan in the, in the living area. A second concept, uh, one of my favorite buildings is the Lovell House by Rudolf Schindler in the south of LA. As you may know, it's a relatively small house in a generic seaside location. But here the vertical structure is visibly exaggerated. By means of their huge size, the columns are somehow denaturalized, bringing excessive magnitude in a rather ordinary program. The result of this oversized arrangement is a generous shaded public space below the house, where the sand of the beach originally touched its feet, as you see in this, in this old photo, giving a public condition to a totally private house. The house and its robust structure appears to me as a domesticated, gigantic monster that allows human life to unfold, be unfold between its legs. Um, Schindler's strategy redefines the domestic by radically changing the size of one of its archi ar architectural parts, exaggerating one of its elements to monstrous proportions. Other possibility of questioning the domestic, 
Questioning the domestic is given not by a change on scale, but by excessive quantities or repetitions of one of its elements. Even though this project for a cathedral by Boulet is not a domestic space, it serves to make the point about quantity. The extreme uh, repetition of a single column to the infinity blurs the distinction between wall and column, potentially dissolving the limit between inside and outside. This excessive repetition gives the column an ornamental quality beyond its basic structural purpose. This is obviously referencing Robert Venturi's definition of the double functioning element. I'm really interested in the way this double functioning cancels or dissolves the individual aspect of the combined elements, resulting in, un in unique architectural objects. Um, as you see in the photograph, uh, the simultaneous patio, window, skylight, column at the center of the music room in Ritoque is an indiv indivisible element which don't even, I mean, you, you can even name it. It's, it. it's an element without a name. The redundant, redundant structure or redundancy, redundancy in a structure, I see it as a way of escaping the, the tyranny of the boring solution of the flexible floor plan could be by giving a closer attention to the friction between space and material structure. As the only present element in a free plan is the structure, it has a potential for spatial determination without imposing a particular use. It can promote a definitive expression of something in itself generic. In this photo, it shows the extreme misalignment between structure and space. It is as if Shinohara was lifting the middle finger to the open free plan, yet keeping it still unspecific in its use. Another beautiful example would be the Tama Library by Toyoito. Material and expression, I'm interested in not obvious or easy tectonics. Like Michelucci's interior of the Chiesa de la Autostrada, where he plays with concrete as if it was a soft textile, a stalactite, or a stalagmite, all at the same time. And the, the final concept is an idea about useless space. Today, it seems that architecture's discourse has been influenced by an urgent call for social relevance, problem solving, down-to-earth solutions, bottom-up approaches, efficiency, and immediate impact. I know that architecture must face the problems and conditions of its time, and these are difficult times indeed. Uh, but this declared fear towards excess and misalignment is a conservative tide that could endanger the existence of the useless in architecture. And actually, for me, the uselessness is the quality that I most enjoy of a building. Today, at the office, we're doing different kinds of projects, private and public, and doing an average of two, comp two competitions every year. I also teach at Universidad Católica, and I am head of its Master in Architecture program. Usually the studios that I teach revolve around the ideas that I, I just mentioned. Uh, to finish, I will go super fast over three projects, hoping that the previous ideas somehow reflect on my work. I won't go into much detail, really. The first project is, is a house, the gut house, which is located in a very steep terrain. I just wanted to show these sections from foreigners looking to South America. The first is by Alexander von Humboldt, where, where you see that the whole continent is this massive mountain, the Chimborazo. And the second drawing is, is done by Le Corbusier, where he depicts the city of Buenos Aires, the Atlantic Ocean, and then this huge massive mountain that dips into the Pacific must be Chile, which is just a <laughs> that thing. Uh, which I think it's, it's nice because uh, that's a very, uh, um, it's a nice way to see our, our, our geography and that's something that has interest us uh, in every project. How the relation with, between the built object and the topography and which relation they, they establish. Um, so this is a recurrent uh, idea. 
the house, maybe it's the most radical in this, in this sense, and replicates the, the slope of the terrain, bringing that uh, condition to the interior and somehow redefining the, the domestic spaces inside of it. Uh, on top of this uh, roof slash uh, surface is a huge stair with somehow uh, gigantic proportions, also not so much uh, linked to a domestic uh, dimension. And the idea was to, to place this, uh, the idea of, a, of, a, of an open floor plan, but in this sloping terrain, and how this uh, topography could alter the idea of the of the open floor plan. The space is supported by these 15 columns. Each, the idea is that each column should be different in order that you don't really read that easily the, the grid. So each point, um, each column is it's a point of, ref, of reference in itself. And then some private areas will protrude these different uh, surfaces. The idea that the, this surface also blocks the, the view to the horizon was something that we wanted to, to do. And the misalignment between the interior, the exterior, the structure, the enclosure, um, so that there's not an, an easy uh, dis distinction between when you are in and out of the house. The second project is a, is a small um, arts department building inside a school, a private school. Uh, this school is characterized by uh, neoclassical buildings from the beginnings of the 20th century. Um, and we wanted to bring to the interior of the school some kind of um, exterior uh, space um, where the kids could really interact in a very free way, an unexpected way. Um, the idea was, first of all, to clear the first floor plan, so the program was uh, divided into a second floor and a minus one floor. So through these huge columns that you see here, which act as a column, as a patio, as a skylight, these three levels were connected. Um, the building is just in the center of this school, which is like a big campus, so this uh, covered um, space acts as, a, as, a, as a, an open link to connect these different areas and buildings. Obviously establishing a, a, some kind of dialogue between these huge columns and the existing columns of the old buildings, the trees, etc. These uh, small skylights uh, are like it's a building with five cores, which was also something that we hope tried to dis dismantle the idea of an open free, free plan that the moment you repeat many times one, one element. And the relations that are established through these uh, voids are, are quite unexpected. They, they also work as windows because they have this opening, so there are different relations that you can establish between these three, level, three levels by this one single uh, oversized column. These are the interiors. The idea of the classrooms is that they were not the normal relation between student and professor. Uh, having a, a, a room with, with many corners, it's not like a frontal room as this auditorium, but it's much more complex in its floor plan. That's the column. These are the plans of the columns. And I really like this photo, like this gigantic monster, yet tamed somehow by the life of the school and the kids playing around it. And the last project, I'm gonna go really fast, it's a, it's a house in a suburb, in a really uh, ugly uh, suburb, but as many suburbs are around the world in every big city. Um, but we wanted to work with two conditions, a structural system that is not usually used in Chile, which is the tilt-up system, and the other idea was keeping all the trees that existed in the plot, which are normally uh, 
cut down and thrown away. These this two decisions changed the, the layout of a suburb house into a much more expanded floor plan um, and a very, like, a house with no specific form in which all the rooms have at least one patio. Uh, and the idea of giving some kind of unity to this whole mess of a floor plan was by repeating one column 400 times, a concrete column that you, we would do in situ at the site. And this column helped us to generate these in-between spaces and try to blur again the distinction between inside and outside. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our second presentation this morning is O Office. So please uh, join me welcoming Jiang Xianghe and Ying Zhang. Uh, good morning. Um, we have great pleasure to be invited uh, in, uh, here to share some of our practicing uh, experience here. Um, because we are using the term, uh, uh, excuse me, because we, I will pr uh, rep represent all of this to speak because it's easier to keep in time. We have the topic of the region. Uh, not because we are uh, really deep into the understanding of religion. It's because uh, in our young children's memory, we don't have any idea about religion. In our uh, early uh, age, I think the only thing we have in memory is the small town we are living. And then in school, we are talk about the whole nation, the country. So there is none thing about, nothing about the religion. But uh, throughout our education in Europe and also uh, the, uh, our practicing in the past uh, 10 years, I think uh, more and more we trying to uh, emphasize in the effort in uh, regional uh, regeneration or kind of self-cultural uh, recognition in our uh, location, in our region. Um, uh, this is the image, it's um, in the, uh, the, the Po River Delta area in 1970s. So um, you see the Atony uh, rising up, the self-made rising up from the uh, a local house and uh, the, the, the telic uh, signals from Hong Kong probably receiving to this house and uh, people start to uh, have the view of the image of the mo modern city like Hong Kong or Manhattan. Uh, at that moment. So it's kind of a hidden strength of the later urbanization of the whole uh, region. Um, Forty years later, the whole region becoming the world's largest uh, uh, metropolitan uh, area. So with a population more than 100 million uh, in this region. And uh, the city growing uh, still continuously growing. So nobody knows where it will go. And um, uh, this picture, this uh, uh, photographic work shows vividly the typical uh, scenario of uh, Pearl River Delta City, the new city, uh, according to us, the rising up from the original city. And uh, everything uh, come into uh, kind of an urban development. But of course, at the same time, another side of the foundation of all office is the education background, uh, both me and Ying in Europe. So um, these two sides of like a mirror system that funding the uh, philosophical foundation of all office. Um, this is <laughs> Ying and me. It's also a kind of mirror system to us. We work closely every day and even we fight against each other every day for <laughs> design discussion in the office. And uh, this is our studio in Guangzhou. It's on top of a silo building, an old uh, industrial silo building uh, near the old downtown Guangzhou. 
uh, we had a very uh, young team and everybody worked closely into a team and everybody is very flexible in moving in one project from the other so that we have a very uh, dynamic relationship to work in a whole team. This is the uh, silo office look in the uh, downtown, uh, old downtown Guangzhou. And um, uh, this picture is showing that uh, the, some of the main uh, projects uh, re realized by all of in this Po River Delta region. Um, probably you can see the diversity of all this uh, project. Uh, the diversity of this project, I, I think it's, uh, from one hand, it's the, uh, our response to each sp specific spot, the uh, local condition and the local uh, technical uh, issue, social issue. But on the other hand, uh, we, we are enjoying to tax or to make a new experiment in each specific location and point. Because uh, we can see later, the whole region actually is far more complex than only one mega city. Um, again, we have this kind of uh, population density map for the whole uh, Po River Delta. So we have uh, high, uh, kind of hyper infrastructure linking all this cluster of city and townships together into a, a so-called macro metropolitan area. And um, uh, all, all, all of this realized projects are scattered in this area, probably uh, as this picture shows. And um, but considering the different geography, uh, a large amount of uh, for uh, immigration to this area and or uh, different language in this region because throughout the history actually the southern China uh, area actually is uh, at uh, in different period they have immigrants from different provinces so different languages different group of people and so it's full of diversity in this region. So it's far more complex than what we can see here, phys physically see in this map. And uh, again, we back to the uh, topic of uh, education. So um, me, uh, I, I saw the and, and uh, work in Belgium. Uh, I got my master program in Leuven. Of course, we both share very similar uh, academic uh, background. We both graduated university in Guangzhou, a local university. And then uh, I went to uh, Leuven, Belgium, University of Leuven, and uh, Ying went to uh, Versailles, the school, uh, architecture school in Versailles in France. So um, I think the most uh, uh, fundamental uh, thing that uh, those uh, experience, education experience gave us uh, is the so-called um, kind of independent uh, way of thinking, uh, critical in analyzing, and the critical position, and independent, uh, independency in, prof uh, in profession and uh, practicing. That's a fundamental thing we have. But when we return to the uh, Po River Delta region, we, uh, it seems that, that, uh, we try to apply somehow the knowledge and what we have seen and what we have learned to this region. We got a lot of problem because the whole, uh, the whole region actually, you see from the picture, you have this uh, huge infrastructure, highways and speed and the uh, skyscrapers are growing from the old uh, generation of uh, housing, house, the city, older generation of the city. And then everything comes into uh, kind of economic and political flow. So everything is flowing like a, a gigantic ocean of uh, urbanization. And as uh, one of our former leaders said, uh, the, only, uh, the only existing thing is developing. So development and developing is the only thing we have here. So not other things exist. So um, we try to draw these two uh, different uh, 
uh, practicing model in di diagrammatic way. So the, uh, the, the left one actually is kind of more contemporary uh, European uh, elite profession model. So each architect's office has its own uh, self-disciplinary um, uh, organization to working within his region, his network, and local craftsmanship. And uh, in, the left side, in the right side, uh, we have the most efficient way of Chinese uh, architectural and engineer office. So every, they just throw themselves directly into the uh, ocean of organization. So they only care about uh, uh, market demand. So what the demand needs, they produce uh, <laughs> they directly and as fast as possible to uh, produce the product to the uh, housing and building product to the market. And, um, and now, because we already seen the speed and the changement and the, the disorder, the post, uh, condition, and also so, many, so much uncertainty to us. So it's step by step, we try to have a kind of a dual system. Uh, of course, it's not a designed system. It's a system that uh, developed or evolved throughout of our pr practicing experience for the past 10 years. So the dual system actually have the kind of core uh, uh, structure. Uh, physically, probably it's the silo office we have. And then we have kind of a substructure that uh, uh, directly on each uh, project we are working on. So, uh, of course, for most of projects, it's not a physical one. It's kind of a virtual uh, organ uh, strategy to work on. So, in each project, actually, we not only design the, bu uh, the building concept or the spatial concept, but also kind of um, a strategy, working strategy way to design the thing. Because uh, by this way, at the same time, we, we can catch the timing because also we can directly react to the local condition, the local uh, uh, social and economic uh, 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 situation in a way. So it's kind of, from the core structure, we uh, kind of deliver uh, the concept or deliver um, the, the, the ideology. And then from the local substructure, actually a lot of feedback so feedback, so it's kind of cycling structure that uh, help us to work continuous work in this region. So again, we have uh, a geographic map on this region. So it's kind, we considered it from the uh, central uh, urban area to the nature. It's kind of a continuity uh, 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 situation. So now we are trying to use two of our projects to describe a little bit more how we work in each project and each location. So the first one actually is located to the coast area. So it's an abandoned Honghua uh, dying, uh, dying mill. It actually is a significant industry uh, monument built up in the early uh, 80s. It's a first generation of collaboration uh, of foreign investment and local uh, cooperation way. And uh, it's abandoned uh, since late 1990. So in that way, um, because of the climate or the uh, short distance from the ocean, so uh, even only 15 years of abundance, it kind of uh, um, classical relic uh, atmosphere showed up in uh, in the side. So uh, the first idea for this one, we we try to uh, remain the whole uh, structure, the building envelope intact, and have kind of uh, a new implantation into the space. So at the same time, uh, on the one hand, we try to uh, maintain the scrap, uh, kind of scrap scrapness of the. Uh, classical atmosphere and at the, at the same time uh, leave a kind of uh, open air, uh, uh, some semi-open air uh, space between the new and old to leave a lot of space for a future art uh, activity and future development. That's a basic idea to leave the project because 
later we have a model and a drawing uh, exercise in the office. But still, um, when the project go directly onto the site because the oh, contractor and the workers are all local workers. So we have to deal with all of this construction method and detailing again, all the thing. And then to try to, uh, even later, because the uh, first building, second building, uh, step by step, we run away the whole factory. And in the second stage, we even have a real uh, on-site office uh, in the factory. And as we, on the side, for this project, quite a lot of decisions are directly made, and a lot of detailing things are directly made on the spot or on the site. So we can see uh, the result of this uh, of, uh, development for the uh, technique, the, the how to pour the concrete and how to build up the steel structure, or we work with the local contractor to try to Im embed this concept into that land. And that's uh, the recent uh, situation. So step by step, we one by one, we ran away and occupy the whole uh, abandoned factory. Become it, it becoming kind of art commune for the uh, for the, in this uh, re, uh, f the landscape valley in far from Shenzhen city. The second one is the photography museum of Lanzhou. It's in another geography location. It's a mountain area quite in the north of Guangdong province. So this, old down, this picture showing the old downtown Banjo, the, the landscape and old downtown, and in between is a new development rising up from the situation. And the old downtown actually is, has been decaying, and people are leaving the old downtown. And since 10 years ago, uh, a Guangzhou curator curated a very special photography festival in this town. And uh, four years later, four years she invited us to uh, part participate in the photography museum uh, project. And we, concept, concept three, we try to have the photography museum within the old downtown having similar structure of the uh, surrounding uh, city, uh, downtown city. Of course, then we have a, a general uh, building envelope to cover the whole structure. Again, modeling, and because of public project, so we need to have the full detail uh, uh, documentation. But and before we re start the real construction, uh, we also tried already uh, renovate small houses on the street and to help to create uh, the future development in old downtown. And but still, when the construction starting, lots of things changement. Uh, happen small things like the mistake in survey, and then later the uh, shifting power, the shifting of the government power, and then material things. Change. So, all, almost the whole scheme are redesigned during the the uh, construction period. So, but still we have kind of local uh, kind of substructure on the side have kind of strong. Uh, we try to use the original concept to control the whole thing and still maintaining, try throughout this, uh, this operation on the side to keep these things going. And um, that's the recent picture. And that's the street view for the nearly completed project. And um, funny thing is, it will open in two weeks, but uh, the whole project is still under construction. Even the artists for the opening exhibition arrived yesterday. They find everything is still under construction. It's, uh, of, of course, it's not always like that, but it's also it's not exception when we practice in China, especially in local condition. So probably we need to have a kind of dual, maybe triple uh, system to work in that. <laughs> I would like to add one thing that uh, actually in most of our projects we could not have a complete design condition before our design. And the design requirement has been always 
keep it changing. And sometimes the budget is not clear at all for us. So uh, normally it is not a good moment for architect to study architectural design. But sometimes we see it as an opportunity for us because we could be involved in a very urge uh, of design decision. And we can, how to say, uh, work together with the client and try to influence them and guide them to kind of a design approach. And step by step to, to redefining kind of a long-term program. This is what I think all of you always try to do. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Our last presentation of the first panel, um, Salvador Macias and Maggie Peredo. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks to Juan, Enrique, and Colombia GS uh, app for inviting us today. When, when we sat together and started thinking about what kind of things have given shape to our practice, we thought that we should talk about these ideas. Um, the things that move us, what inspire us about architecture, our academic studies, our professors and researchers. We also thought on necessity and independent practice needs to self-employ. The location of our practice have played a key role in this. We wrote failures in terms of training. And lastly, we thought of the few assignments that have pulled out clear answers to deep questions, challenges where engineers were not necessarily required, but a profound intellectual work instead. Let us start by showing this image made by us that represents the moment when, for the first time, someone outside our country, the Architectural Foundation of London and Liga, asked us what our office project was through a collage. We put on the same level and same imaginary site the traditional Mayan hut and the Farnsworth house. We like to think that these two architectures are not so distant. Both establish a base that regulates the land, both set vertical elements that support a cover, and both use an open floor plan at the inside. For us, beyond technique, there are no significant differences between them. We wanted to refer to both simple approaches to describe what our office was looking for. We were born and our office is based in Guadalajara, the second most populated city in Mexico. Guadalajara is the dot on your left, and on the right you see Mexico City. Historically, Mexico has been a centralized country. The relevant aspects of the country happen in the capital city. The great commissions are generated there. Architect Luis Barragan, for example, was from Guadalajara, and he eventually moved to Mexico City, and that was the only way he could belong to the country's cultural and intellectual circles. Therefore, starting an independent practice outside the capital inevitably led us to start a local practice. We have always returned to the city, and from here we are interested in being able to continue doing our work. The great boom and growth of the city came in the 20th century. It came along with the importation of foreign architecture models, mostly modern Corvusian models, like you see here. But also there was the group of Mediterranean influence, influences led by Barragan's vision on weather and local techniques in his emerging architecture. The teachers who had an influence on us and first architects with whom we worked had a preference for the techniques and the language of the second one. In any case, as in all of Latin America, these architectures were made with the economy, economy and the resources that were available. This type of architecture for us had been the most ordinary and familiar. It wasn't until we decided to leave the city and move to Barcelona for our masters that we found a kind of mecca of Latin American students doing all kinds of researching about architecture 
in their context of origin. And of course, a great interest by many of the professors on Latin America. Suddenly, the familiar took another dimension. We gave it a, brief, a different reading and meaning. When the time to choose our own research topics came, our tutors in Barcelona, like Josep Ketlas and Jaume Rossell, encouraged our intuition to study our territory from the eyes of two German artists who had a great influence and interest in Mexico. On one side, you see the analytic Bauhaus professor, Joseph Albers, and on the other, Matthias Geritz, an extraordinary artist, artist who came to Mexico to introduce some of the principles of the Bauhaus into the schools of architecture. Somehow, by being at Barcelona, Barcelona we rediscovered and had a deep look over our backgrounds through the both of them. About eight years before, Salvador and I met on a trip to see primitive architectures in Veracruz. Several routes would come later throughout Mexico, and those journeys together left a deep impression on us and marked the beginning of our history and a common interest about the primitive and the vernacular that keeps captivating us until now. This we shared with Geritz and Alvers. In fact, these images are from one of many photographic studios of form and geometry made by Alvers during his trips to Mexico. We discovered through them a great capacity of analysis and synthesis of abstraction of many of these kind of structures that we had also been interested in. For example, this is the floor plan of Ciudadela Square, a very important sunken plaza at the pre-Hispanic urban site of Teotihuacan that Alvers studied. The argument of the thesis was that Alvarez was painting abstractions of concave or convex spaces, squares or courtyards like the pre-Hispanic ones, an exercise that he repeated for more than 30 years in the homage to the square as it is well known. And on the other hand, the sculpture of Geritz, always influenced by this primitive and so rooted Mexican monumentality. We return to Guadalajara from Barcelona at a time of global economic crisis. And although we were eager to do things, there wasn't much work to do. We had the opportunity to get into our university to teach, but we needed to look for other ways to self-employ us. So we designed a methodology that would imply leaving the city, leaving the country, and that would keep us studying, analyzing, fitting our practice from other contexts. Each one of these images represents study trips or workshop trips that we arranged in our office as if they were any other project, which had a specific place and a specific subject, and a group of architects, students of all ages were involved. This put to the test the methods, the methods we had learned from Albers and Gerditz about absorbing and abstracting the experiences of the world. For example, this is a villa of vernacular houses we visited in Japan. And this is a common Dutch roof or Palapa roof at the Pacific coast in Mexico. These kind of confrontations promoted that our ordinary and local challenges became a deposit of possibilities and an opportunity for new synthesis. Somehow we were looking to the same just differently. And in this going back and forth, we needed to be aware of how, of how things are done in the place we do architecture. What are the existing skills on those who build and how to keep a dialogue with them. This is a plane made of clay we acquire in a craft market in the city of Lima, Peru. This object reminds us of significant ideas. On one hand, it represents the progress of technology, the globality of the world, it speaks of our time. However, it doesn't fly, it only represents the idea of flying. We see the transnational sign of Air France with Peruvians aboard and Peruvian flags. For us, it speaks of a global aspiration, but at the same time, a strong relationship with a specific locality. We used to think that we were these Peruvians returning home every time, understanding that that's where we wanted to place ourselves, between the understanding of our geographical and sociocultural situation and the needs and aspirations of our time, which are inevitably global. 
Let me talk a bit about how locality has played a key role in our practice. Guadalajara is today a city of artisans. The artisanal workforce is still an important and current issue. And construction is not exempt from this. Experimentation in the construction processes are still viable and at a reasonable cost. This is a great opportunity. All throughout Mexico, actually, but in the case of Guadalajara, the need to get our first independent works forced us to build our initial projects. Culturally, the idea of an architect is closely linked to construction there. Hiring, in, hiring an architect to only develop design, it's a luxury for a few experienced offices. We took advantage of that moment, building to, together with these craftsmen, learning so much from their skills, but also about economy, local resources, etc. This made possible a work founded at the very practice, the construction, the performance of the building site. To take over the logistics and administration as a general contractor demanded a lot of time. It was taking away too much space for reflection. So we decided to, to found our current office, just bringing in the attitude the attitude of involving ourselves in the building process without the contractor role. It is common to hear, are you the kind of architects who build or those who only design? We like to say that we are right in the middle. Back to the moment of our returning from Barcelona, the opportunity to supervise the construction of this Carmen Pinoza's tower in Guadalajara came. As a local office, the task was to translate her intentions to the most traditional way of doing in Guadalajara. And this was a great challenge and learning that lasted four years. To know which things are suitable and which are not in terms of, our, of building in our city. Actually, Gerritz used to say that Mexico is a country where everything is possible. Something that has interested us about him is to understand how a foreigner becomes local and how he understands in a very deep and clear way the environment where he works. This is the only piece of architecture that Gerritz ever made, the Experimental Museum of El Eco in Mexico City. He was, it was an architectural manifesto against the Mexican rationalist architecture of the 50s that he named Emotional Architecture. An annual contest of young architects is made to develop a temporary intervention to the patio that enables other ways to use the space, a bit like the PS1 program here. After our researches on the artist, we couldn't have been more thrilled to be chosen to participate. We had lost every contest we had done before, which had uh, much more larger and ambitious programs than this. However, this one had such a special meaning for us. So we put all of our energy on this contest and we were very lucky to win. After our building exercises at Guadalajara, we felt a great attraction for the only material who had no coding, showing its real age and its handmade process the clay floor of the courier. We wonder if we could somehow make it evident. And on the other hand, Gerritz manifests himself by arranging the walls of the museum at angles that will never be 90 degrees. So we, we thought that we could establish a relationship with the building by lifting the floor of the patio, building a new diagonal. With this, we could erase the short wall that divides the museum and the street, building a bridge, a viewpoint towards the park that is in front of it. And at the interior, at the interior a natural forum towards the gallery. All these intentions made possible with one simple action. We felt that we came out with something that seemed that always had been there or that could have been that way originally. Of course, we enjoyed the positive reactions towards the proposal especially because it was our first project as Macias Peredo Studio. But it was the statement behind it that had a profound impact on our practice, to be able to say, this is the kind of architecture we want to do. Simple, discreet, 
fully integrated to the site using its own resources, but powerful with clear intentions and that, and that promotes events that change the user's experience. This became more of a question for the future, which we truly intend to give answers to in every new challenge we meet. As it happens in this image of one of our favorite photographers, Mariana Jampolsky, where with a simple action of arranging elements that are already there, somehow can transform it into experience and environment in the subtlest way. Both the ground and the walls are made up of the same stone as well as the huts at the inside that are made with the branches and located underneath the shadow of those trees. Like happened in this inside piece, we wanted to take advantage of our first retrospective exhibition and talk about this performance of the building site we mentioned before. We thought of this tiny gallery as a site in itself. We got 33 tones of the leftovers from the same volcanic stone of the floor. The piece depended on the capacity of the hands that were going to execute the piece. We only designed the rules. The naturalness of the masons enabled the work. We reviewed the space of the gallery on our way, and since that day, one of the questions in the office is how to do projects where spontaneity and freedom have space, and that not necessarily everything has a determined, closed, and defined when, way when undertaking projects. At some point, our office map of projects started to expand. We are now working on an X-ray map of architecture tradition in different parts of the country to understand with a quick reading the typologies, systems, climatic circumstances, and resources that remain at hand of these sites. This for the upcoming Venice Biennale. Because in this expansion, we have learned from some failed experiences. This is one example, a Montessori school in Mazatlan, which needed to be built and designed in only seven months. We did not have the time to do a proper reading of the site, and it became necessary to import experienced labor from other cities to be able to finish on time. It was a difficult process, although the image doesn't show that. So. All of these experiences are fundamental on what we do now. And although we keep defining ourselves, we are focusing on producing an architecture that tries not to impose, but that seeks to be part of a continuity with the specific place and environment. Tries to absorb from the local, understand the place with the attitude of a foreigner, naively as a clear plan, but concise and synthetic as a German artist. No matter the scale, try to balance between the personal and the anonymous, the plant and the spontaneous, the Mayan hut and the first world house. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, well, I just want to start by saying thank you for sharing such um, personal reflections on your practice. Um, and giving us the, the behind the scenes look of um, how, how you're founding your practice and how you're maintaining it. And thank you for the opportunity to see all these practices in one place. I know that at GSAP, the question of practice and models of new practice is um, constantly something that we talk about here. So, so thank you first. Um, and it, it seems to me that the, the setup of the idea of global education to local practice, those terms are, are not so clear. In, in how we're talking about it with this panel, I think that um, you know one might imagine global as being fast, ubiquitous, slow as maybe being, uh, or local as being maybe being more slow or isolated. But it seems like the way in which you're dealing with that spectrum of global education to then local practice is much more of a, a different kind of engagement in which each of your practices seems to be filters of some in some sense of those um, of those two lenses. And then each of you seem to, or each of the practices seem to um, kind of redefine a notion of a local or to kind of take, to think through what extent does the word local actually, um, what does that mean in your practice? Um, and how do we expand the idea? So it seemed, you know, with Max, 
uh, I thought there's an idea about a de destabilization of the local in terms of the topography or the sort of <coughs> typical approaches to you know, Chilean landscape. Um, and it seemed with your, with your talk, um, there's an idea about sort of intensification, like an intensification of local construction practices and craft. Um, and then with you two, it's this, I, you know, this, you even talked about it in your, your, your lecture, this, the conflict of how do you balance identity or memory of a region or a place then with the, the rising urbanization of China. Um, and so I think that idea of a filter, the, this sort of expansion of a notion of local, to me seems really interesting within the context of the, of the panel. Um, and then I also want to go back to the question of the intellectual project of forming pr a practice, um, which Juan set up uh, at the beginning. And you know, maybe, maybe to have a sense of, in your talks, it seems like there's practices within the practice, that you, there's, a, it, there's sort of a, a redefinition of practice at certain moments, right? Um, and, and so maybe to, to begin with is just to think a little bit about the beginning and where you are now um, in your practice and you know, how did you sustain your practice early on uh, when, you, when you first began and the, the sort of economic equation of it, right? Um, and then now, how do you, you know, uniquely maintain and maybe nourish the practice as it grows? And so I'd love to hear from each of you. Um, yeah. Well, in, in my case, I think that the <coughs> mine is a very small office. Uh, we are normally between three, two, five. Maximum, we've been six at the office. So the the structure is very simple, and it has always been very um, variable. And maybe it's due to my um, my uh, yeah going like going out of, of Chile for a while for studying or traveling and uh, teaching at the same time. So for me, it hasn't been a, like a goal to keep an office like. A, like a production, uh, mm -hmm. or to grow uh, mm -hmm. in a very fast way. It has been more like a life cycle, which sometimes mm -hmm. it's more intense, other times it's much more calm and I get time to do other stuff. Um, so I guess that the, the, the plan of the office is something very, it's much more spontaneous, like in its um, everyday functioning. Um, and regarding the, the, the education and these experiences in Chile and abroad, I think it's, it's a way of um, focusing on certain aspects. It's not about going out and learning something that you then bring to your country, but more it's going out to test what you've been doing before, mm -hmm. looking at it again, mm -hmm. and maybe like uh, fine-tuning on some aspects that you really want to I don't know, be more radical or, or understand better. Um, but I think that it's, it's, it's about, and I think that in that sense, the local aspect of things is fundamental. Huh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and in my case, yeah, the, this idea of, of topography and how this could affect the built object has been a key line of research. Mm -hmm. okay. Just a moment ago, I was um, talking about how um, Gerritz used to say that Mexico is a place where everything is possible. And I believe that um, in many ways it is true. I mean, Mexico is a, a place uh, where there's much more freedom you know, regulations are not so restricted. And uh, this this for the bad and the good. I mean, there are people that just simply jump over regulations, you know, which is bad. But uh, when well intended, the, I believe there is a huge opportunity to do architecture. And um, so in our case, um, we have found that, um, you know, th this thing that we also talked about, about how um, we are trying or we are on our search, uh, trying not to uh, impose architecture over a specific context, uh, we can 
translate that also in our um, way of doing architecture, in the process of doing architecture. I mean, the <clears throat> in a place like this, uh, in Mexico, just I, as I was saying, to um, the instructions of architecture that we can translate over a plan or our drawings uh, become more like uh, rules to play with. You know, we like to think that our work uh, mm, is, uh, it has evolved, but in the way we do architecture, we try to think that uh, the things that we specify are just more like a mm, game rule sheet that, that, that is there for people to uh, play with, that people can interpret those instructions or those rules into their own way of doing. And that helps us to have uh, an architecture that is trying to do, have a dialogue with all these different actors that uh, participate on, on that doing of architecture. Um, I'll write to, um, try to uh, read, go, th go through a little bit uh, our education and uh, practicing experience because we both educated in a local university, but uh, when we graduated, actually the, the, the fast, the rapid urbanization just started. So we are feel a little bit with both. Um, maybe we are not that used to that uh, rhythm. So we, we found that we, we, we are losing in a way. So we choose to uh, go abroad to continue to study and to, up, to observe in different culture. And um, of course, when you go from the very local China to <coughs> Western Europe, so it's a uh, befell, I think directly a kind of cultural shock. So you don't feel easy at that because it's a completely different way of looking at uh, uh, city and architecture and even uh, uh, questioning and reasoning uh, methodology. So um, when we try to uh, forget and to try to uh, to reinstall our knowledge structure, that's a really, um, I would say to us it's uh, difficult but um, as a, to me, I felt refreshed. Uh, it's a very difficult moment when we arrived in, 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 in Europe. But after five years of study and working in Western Europe, we, when we decided to return to that uh, rapid uh, urbanization, yeah, that we felt another cultural shock because <laughs> The speed, uh, the uh, speed of life is so fast when we return to China. So, uh, I think there is almost cannot have normal discussion about programming, uh, about uh, what we're going to achieve in the, uh, with the local people. It's very, very fundamental and very, very grounded uh, uh, question. That's why we rethink and retry. Um, to start from, where, of course, we collaborate with other companies to, uh, to, to, to uh, design and develop a very big project in the beginning when we return. But we chose to, another way, we chose to uh, establish our own studio. In the beginning, we have only four people in the office, and we start from a very tiny project according to Chinese. So we try to, because at the moment people are still thinking architecture kind of a monumental thing. So theaters, museums, and so we try to re-establish in a really daily life way of architecture. So we create our studio and create small projects so people visit it. So from a very grounded and very uh, daily way, we try to convince people to think and to work in a different way, I think. Actually, we from in, in China for the moment, it's even difficult to keep a small office than become bigger. Become bigger, it's even easier because you can easily get a lot of project without, if you don't care about the quality. And so normally now we have uh, 15 to 20 people and we have, because the project always change, I mean the situation of the project always change. Sometimes it stops, sometimes suddenly it comes back with even 10 times more. 
So we have to really keep a very flat uh, and f flat and flexi flexible working system. And of course, with this kind of uh, developing pressure, it's, it's very easier to lose. But we always believe that uh, with tiny action, uh, with uh, interesting design strategy, we can influence a little bit. And step by step, it could be kind, kind of, uh, as Xiang said, the daily, uh, daily life uh, movement could become bigger and bigger and do something to, as kind of a feedback of the urbanization, the huge urbanization. To, to, yeah. to start a kind of real conversation with people with mm -hmm. real space, not kind of images of cities and mm -hmm. renderings of cities. Mm -hmm. Exactly like that. And maybe just to pick up on your point about yeah. the, the pressures of an, architecture pro of an architectural practice um, within <coughs> different contexts. Um, for each of you, are there, um, let's say, rules or guidelines that you use in your practice to maintain design values or design ambitions? So for example, you know, are, is there certain kinds of work that you actively try to engage? Are there, um, you know, are there certain kinds of strategies that you, you use in your office to go for certain kinds of work? Are there things that you resist? You, you just described something you resist is not to grow. So I'm just curious about whether there's ways that you, you fight for the office that you want to have through um, a maintenance of uh, rules or guidelines. Um, well, I, I can talk about two. The first one would be that we try to um, yeah, keep ourselves um, having spaces for reflection because when you go to the everyday practice, sometimes, you know, the uh, developing of projects doesn't give you time or room or space for that. So, for example, for us to be teaching at a university or even to come here, you know, today to talk to Colombia and, you know, force us to sit down and have, uh, you know, to, to, to make ourselves making questions and to go over our backgrounds and digging into our practice, you know, all of those kind of things help us to do that, to have that space of re reflection that sometimes you don't have when you have to do a project, you know, in the specific time that is required. Mm -hmm. So that would be one of, like, a strategy. Mm -hmm. And another one, it's more, uh, like, like you were saying, is um, a more um, intuitive and is more, I, I think, that really inspires us and that uh, we really connect with, and is that um, we try to always um, look for, um, we try to see, or when, when, for example, we are trying to approach for the first time to a place, to a specific place, we try to look f for the vernacular, you know, the most common uh, architecture, the people architecture, and it, it is a strategy that helps us to um, understand a place. You know, the, we, we like to, to say that um, mm, that kind of architecture um, doesn't fail. I mean, in terms of it reflects, it is a reflection of a place, and it is also, um, it has the wisdom of, of, a, of a specific place. So if, if, if it's important for us to have a good reading of a place and we go and look to that primitive vernacular architecture and that's like a kind of a strategy that we use, like very personal. Yeah. Um, I think uh, for this question, uh, I think uh, when we just, when we, in the beginning, when we just return from uh, abroad, <coughs> from Europe, I think I have quite a um, very structural and systematic mind to do to two things: mm -hmm. to create a small office and to have goal to target, and then what we. But later, I think uh, more and more with now, I think we developed in a more uh, natural way, like um, because uh, in a group like us in Guangzhou is quite exceptional. So. 
uh, you cannot set any goal that we need to recruit. For instance, we have new project and we need to recruit how many person personnel? So two or three, but you cannot find the right person. I mean, because you know, as you know, the local education are completely different is what we are going to achieve. So if we don't, so we just continue to work on small group. But so I more and more, if if you work in a people speaking in different languages, that's that's more uh, that 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 will be a disaster. So. Uh, to us, it's becoming, we don't have any specific goal for the future development, how to develop office. It's, it's more a natural and daily, uh, 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 natural flow in office. So if we have the right person to talk with, we can collaborate with this project or not. If not, we don't. If we have to get the right person in the office, we can have, because the office, whole office is like a family group. So we need to, a kind of, uh, uh, speak the same language and have the same value, not a structural way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, it, I know it, it's more and more uh, uh, when we develop like that, office like that, the group like that, and and it also can create a interesting conversation when client arrive and visit us. Mm -hmm. So they gradually or sometimes certainly they understand what we should work together and what we should achieve in our future life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because when we look at the city, the, the urbanization, that's, that's, I think more, peop more and more people will think about in living and working in another way. That's mm -hmm. what we are. Well, in, in my case, the, the relation with my, with my practice and teaching has been a, a key aspect to keep the, the, the ideas of the practice somehow uh, mm -hmm. challenged mm -hmm. uh, by the works of the students, mm -hmm. especially, and by the discussion that occurs inside the, the space of the school of, of the school of architecture. And that's a relation that I, I, I'm always trying to, to keep and, and as a project in the future, the idea is to keep working in that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially when, you, you, when you're working in a, in a small office and you don't have that space of discussion with a larger group, mm -hmm. it's important to bring those ideas to, to your students and, and, and discuss in, in different terms, maybe with more freedom uh, and in different uh, contexts. But, but I think for me that, that has been a very uh, um, good uh, yeah, conversation. Um, and the other thing that I enjoy is, is to be uh, in the different phases of a project, from its first uh, stage until construction and all that's in between and all the problems and traveling and discussions and solving problems uh, during construction. And, and I mean, that's something that I really enjoy. So my idea of a practice is, is to keep it mm. in a size that I can be, in a way, involved in every, in all those uh, different stages. Hmm. Maybe we have time for one, one question, one or two questions. Uh, maybe I'll open up to the audience if there's a couple questions. Thank you. Um, well, it's been very exciting to me to, to discover a pattern uh, among you, your three practices. You've, uh, you've mentioned something that, that I really find uh, essential, which is uh, duality. You've talked about mirrors and, um, and mirrors that reflect uh, Farnsworth House against uh, the traditional hut. So, as if uh, global and local were the two sides of the same thing. And, um, and it was funny to, to imagine you as, uh, as a kind of uh, double agent, as uh, architects that were focused on, 
on created uh, sophisticated links uh, between things that looks uh, completely different. And uh, I, well, I assume that, that it implies to, to live in a kind of uh, permanent sensation of estrangement uh, and, and as real strangers or foreigners, as you said, in your own uh, birthplaces. Uh, what I was uh, really interested in, in knowing about is uh, which are the tools that you deploy to show your networks that, that, uh, that, you are, um, that, 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 your, origi that or, your origins are, are the same. Than, than theirs, and um, and how do you uh, f how do you achieve to to show you that what they really want is the unis unexpected, the 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 other side of the of the well the reflect of the things that they think they want. As a local. It's, you mean from the point of view of the client? Yeah, maybe the, yeah, the client, but, but not also the clients. Your, your teaching uh, tasks or, or, well, your surroundings. I mean, your, the environment you move uh, in your everyday uh, life. Yeah. Sorry, I, I understood the first part, but the question I didn't understand. Uh, no, I, I didn't understand. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, no, well, I mean, which are your attitudes, the, the, the tools you use? Uh, well, uh, since graphic systems to, to negotiation techniques to show them that uh, what they really want is that they, want, they don't expect. Uh, the, the, what can you offer different to the other architects that are local just because you've been global and you, uh, you look global or you have a global perspective? Uh, it's a hard question. I don't know if I have an answer for that. I mean, um, because that would suppose that I have an opinion about the other architects that work in my same, and I don't know even how they work. So um, it, it's really hard to talk about how others would face uh, the same uh, problem. I, I mean, I have my way of working, and I have my way of dealing with clients and contractors. Um, and I, I hope I showed some of these ideas in, in my presentation, but it's not a, a, a strict norm, uh, and it's always some, somehow adapting to the conditions of each commission and the discussions that appear from each uh, architectural problem. It's, it's much more something that you are working on constantly, uh, rather than have a set of rules from which I design and it's, it's, I mean, there are rules, but they're like a framework on which you, you work in every case uh, differently, I guess. Um, at least that's the way that I approach uh, design. Um, and, and in terms of, of this global or local issue, I think the distinction is very hard to, to draw today. Uh, I mean, maybe... In the context of, context of Chile, maybe uh, 30 or 50 years ago, there was a very clear line between what you could understand as local versus global. But today, uh, I think that's not anymore. Uh, and, and at least South America, I guess Mexico too, are continents of countries that are changing a lot uh, at the moment. Well, China, it's the same. So it's, um, I think it's a super interesting conversation, but it's very hard to, to draw the line between what's global and local and how what we have learned outside can be somehow rethought in the process of doing locally. Mm. I, I guess that's exactly what can make it new or different to others. I mean, to, to get out of where you are and then come back, I mean, to, co to that, that kind of confrontation, that's what makes it different, you know? I don't know how different from others, but that's 
basically the mixture of those things that make something happen, you know? You take fragments of uh, texts, uh, ways of inhabiting the space, uh, typologies, uh, I don't know, uh, environments, everything that enriches your work. That's exactly, you know, how local or how global, it, it doesn't matter really, it's the mixture of both, that, that's what I would say. Great, well we should probably move on to the next panel, but I suspect that the discussion will be ongoing throughout the day. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.